How much does Christmas cost? If you were to give a gift off the Rob Reports 40th Annual Ultimate Gift Guide, your selections could include, and these aren't an exhaustive list, these are just a few. You could give the Laver Kierman Persian Rug for $800,000, that is. Coveted for their intricate floral designs, Laver Kierman Persian Rugs are some of the most sought after carpets by collectors and design lovers alike. For the holidays, the Claremont Rug Company is making this rare mid-19th century example available as a part of a gift package for $800,000, exclusively for a Rob Report reader. It was part of a 175-piece collection assembled over five generations by a family of art collectors and likely took a team of 10 artisans five years to weave this rug by hand. The art level design was made using natural dyes, which along with the rug's colossal spread, it's larger than 15 feet by 25 feet, will ensure that it retains its value as a collector's item for years to come. Or if you're more in the musical area, like, like me and Ted, you might want to give Eric Clapton's 1939 Martin Triple Lock 42 model. No acoustic guitar is more famous or more coveted than this 1939 Martin guitar. I want it just because it's a Martin, you know. Uh, Eric Clapton's good, but uh, the Martin guitar is, is is really quite a quite a great instrument. Available only through Rob Report's Ultimate Gift Guide, Eric Clapton played this guitar during what may be the best known and, and most acclaimed of his performances over the past, you know, six, seven decades. Er, in early 1992, at the Bray Film Studios in Windsor, England, he mesmerized a somewhat small audience with a 17-song acoustic set that was recorded for a session of MTV's Unplugged series. Uh, and soon released thereafter as, as an album. And uh, he played this guitar, serial number 73234, during several songs, including the slower version of his rock anthem, uh, Layla. The album revitalized Clapton's career by winning him six Grammy Awards, selling 26 million copies of the album worldwide, remains his best-selling record. Uh, Clapton appears on the cover there of the album playing his, his guitar, only one million dollars. I probably won't be owning that one. How about a 164 foot semi-custom Benetti Fisker 50 yacht? That's the one I want. That's the one Ted wants. Starts at 37 million. Henry Fisker is in a stranger to super yachts. The automotive designer regularly spends time in the Mediterranean aboard vessels owned by his friends and business acquaintances, but he hadn't yet designed a yacht in, in more than two decades, really, really hadn't done it, and, and not since he was a student at the Art Center College of Design in Pasadena, California. Anyway, when Fisker casually mentioned his interest in styling a yacht with Benetti, the Italian shipbuilder, he immediately agreed to the project. He said, yeah, design it and we'll build it. The objective, Fisker said, was to create a yacht that was as functional as it was forward in its design. Uh, he says, as with the car industry, many amazing concepts never actually materialized. So we wanted to come up with one that was feasible and would actually be built. The challenge was to do more than just throw another concept out there, but to imagine an innovative and unique design that would go from rendering to reality. This 164 semi-custom Benetti Fisker 50 can be a, a reality for whoever has the money, as I said, starts at 37 million. If you add on to it, it'll cost more, of course. Uh, 
the, the curved shape of the hull near the stern calls to mind the, the haunches of a sports car, the bow accented with black carbon fiber, horizontal stainless <coughs> steel bars resembles a grill. The cabin calls for six cabins in this ship. Hit that next one. Okay, no, we're going to the airplane, all right. All right, so finally you could choose this, this Arion Corporation supersonic business jet. This just starts at 120 million. Nothing new about supersonic flight. You know, military aircraft have exceeded the speed of sound every day. Uh, and until, until 2003, even civilians could travel on the Concorde but building a next generation transport jet to replace the Concorde has proven a very frustrating quest and, and that's thanks to the high fuel costs, astronomical cost of, of bringing a new aircraft design from drawing board to the market, the noise restrictions that they have over the United States and Europe and other parts of the world uh, forbid them to actually go into supersonic flight over those continents. It, but, and so those, those factors don't really favor uh, the positive cost-benefit analysis, but in any case, the Arion Corporation is determined to build the first supersonic business jet. Uh, it's a Nevada-based company. They've patented the wing design that promises top-of-the-class efficiencies. It has a secure, uh, secure deep pocket uh, already they have deep pocket financial backing from uh, billionaire Robert Bass. I used to work for Robert uh, Bass back in, in the day when I was in seminary in their security department. But anyways, he's, he's providing the financial backing and it's, it's formed a, a, also a partnership with Airbus that, that provides access to the engineering expertise of that company. Uh, Arion was established in 2002 and two years ago it began developing this, this jet, the AS4, AS2, expects to fly the aircraft for the first time in 2021 and begin deliveries in 2023. It already has 20 aircraft on order, uh, backed by refundable de deposits, and, and those jets are mainly reserved for the fractional ownership by FlexJet, which placed the order in 2015. The AS2's designers are aiming for a maximum speed of Mach 1.5, about 990 miles per hour, a 6,000 mile range. When, when flying over most land areas, as, as I mentioned, the pilots have to throttle back to subsonic speeds, but the hours that they gain over water, less restric restricted parts of the world, could shorten flight time substantially. For example, a flight from Washington DC to Paris will be three hours shorter than a normal flight. And you'll save more than six hours flying from San Francisco to Singapore. Of course, if you've got the $120 million to, to start with. Hit that neck, there you go. Here's what it looks like inside. What do you think it would cost? Now, by the way, the, the Rob Report reader is uh, the average annual income of, of the normal Rob Report reader is $1.5 million with an average net worth of more than $5 million. So that probably doesn't include any of us. But it's interesting to see what the, what the fancy people are able to buy if you've got, got the funds. But all right, let's, let's throttle back a little bit and think about, well, what, what if we were to give all of the gifts suggested in the Christmas Carol the 12 days of Christmas? What would it cost today, do you suppose? I, I have records that show that it cost, back in 1988, to give the 12 gifts of Christmas, and that's just one gift, you know, not all those many times that you sing it, and giving those gifts over and over and over again, just giving them one time. Back in, in 1988, it was $13,853.33. What do you think it costs today? Well, the two six, 2016 prices haven't been announced yet, but your cost in 2015 was $34,131. 215 for a partridge in a pear tree. $290 for two turtle doves. Three French hens cost you $182. Four calling birds, $600. Five golden rings, $750. It must be tiny. 
Seven swans of swimming, man, this is, that's the expensive gift. It's $13,125 for seven swans of swimming. Eight maids of milking, $58. They're, they're fairly inexpensive. <laughs> Might be able to buy Janie's eight maids of milking. <laughs> doesn't mention how much the cow would cost, though. Everybody assumed back then, I guess, that you'd have one. Uh, nine ladies dancing, 7,553. They're even less than the swans. Ten lords a-leaping. They're less than, than the ladies, $5,509. Eleven pipers piping. And the musicians went way, way down. $2,635 for eleven pipers. Twelve drummers drumming, 2,855. At least they beat the pipers, I guess. So... You understand here, the, the price, price for the milkmaids was eight maids of milking, but that's just for one hour. The ladies, lords, and pipers and drummers, I think, was just the price for one day. And uh, so how much does Christmas cost is the, is the question that we began with. For, for many folks, it costs months of post-Christmas charge bills, gifts to return, pounds to lose, you know, because we've eating all the good Christmas goodies. But the real cost of Christmas, we really, you can't measure it in dollars spent, can you? In gifts given or miles traveled or shopping hassles experienced. But Christmas does cost. The first Christmas brought joy and celebration and worship, singing and hope. The Savior of the world was born to proud, happy families, a proud, happy couple there in the stable. Long expected King of Kings had arrived. The shepherds came, the angels sang, all of them rejoicing. Yet the bill for that Christmas came due 33 birthdays later. The Christmas baby grew to be a man and he gave his life in an event known as the crucifixion. That's the real cost of Christmas. The only begotten Son of God. The Bible calls it the cross. We call it Good Friday. God calls it love and the free gift of eternal life. Christmas came so that you, you and I might have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I, took, I spoke about that with the folks yesterday. We need a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. But it didn't come without sacrifice. W.T. Connor, a great theologian and former professor at Southwestern Seminary, said five decades ago, the act of faith is an act in which we trust Him as Savior and at the same time submit to Him as Lord. The reality is that we often want to take him as Savior, but we neglect to apply his lordship to our lives. Where is the lordship of Christ? How much does Christmas really cost? And we, we, we must realize our relationship to Christ carries responsibility. As we consider this cost of Christmas, understand that the Bible clearly states the lordship of Christ and that Christ calls us to absolute submission to His Lordship. His Lordship is a biblical fact that is non-debatable, undeniable. It's cut and dry. It's been settled. Christ is number one. He must be number one in our lives. He was Lord at His birth. Luke 2.11 says, For today in the city of David... There has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Yeah. He was Lord in his death and resurrection. Acts 5 or Acts 2, 36 says, Therefore let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. He is Lord, he's head, the head of the body of Christ. The local church, 1 Corinthians 12, 5 says, And there are varieties of ministries and the same Lord. One day all people will, will recognize His Lordship. Philippians 2, 8-10 tells us, 
being found in, a, in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow, those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Even the demons recognize his divine lordship. James 2.19 says, You believe that God is one, you do well. The demons also believe and shudder. Christ is Lord. The New Testament affirms it. Have you accepted it? Is he Lord of your life? Not only does the New Testament affirm this fact, but Christ himself asserts the fact of his lordship. There's a, a personal implication to his lordship. Christ desires to be lord and ruler, not just of the world, but of your life, of my life. One commentator says, it is an impoverished and disobedient individual believer who calls Jesus Lord, but does not submit to his lordship in any meaningful or discernible way. What does Christ call us to do? What does Christmas cost us? Notice these claims upon our lives. In, in John 3, Christ calls us to conversion. Let me read, read it to you from the Message Bible. John 3, beginning verse 11. Listen carefully. I am speaking sober truth to you. I speak only of what I know by experience. I give witness only to what I have seen with my own eyes. There is nothing secondhand here, no hearsay. Yet instead of, instead of facing the evidence and accepting it, you procrastinate with questions. If I tell you things that are plain as the hand before your face, and you don't believe me, what use is there in telling you of things you can't see, the things of God? No one has ever gone up into the presence of God except the one who came down from that presence, the Son of Man. In the same way that Moses lifted the serpent in the desert, so people could have something to see and then believe, it is necessary for the Son of Man to be lifted up. And everyone who looks up to Him, trusting and expectant, will gain a real life, eternal life. This is how God loved the world. He gave His Son, His one and only Son, and this is why. So that no one need be destroyed by believing in Him, anyone can have a whole and lasting life. God didn't go to all the trouble of sending his son merely to point an accusing finger, telling the world how bad it was. He came to help, to put the world right again. Anyone who trusts in him is acquitted. Anyone who refuses to trust him has long since been under the death sentence without knowing him. And why? Because of that person's failure to believe in the one-of-a-kind son of God when introduced to him. This is the crisis we're in. God, light, streamed into the world, but men and women everywhere ran for the darkness. They went for the darkness because they were not really interested in pleasing God. Everyone who makes a practice of doing evil, addicted to denial and illusion, hates God, light, and won't come near it, fearing a painful exposure. But anyone working and living in truth and reality welcomes God, light, so the work can be seen for the God work it is. In Revelation 3.14, Christ calls us to absolute submission. Let's read those verses and, and what follows. It says, To the angel of the church in Laodicea, the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God, says this, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth because you say I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing and you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I advise you to buy, me, buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may become rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and that the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed and I say to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. Therefore, be zealous and repent. 
Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him, and he with me. He who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And then in Luke 9, beginning verse 23, Christ calls us to deny ourselves. And he was saying to them all, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will save it. For what is a man profited is if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory, in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. In Luke 14, 33, Christ calls us to forsake all, so that none of you can be my disciple who does not give up all his own possessions. In Matthew 5, 16, he calls us to glorify God in everything we do. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. In Matthew 28, beginning at verse 18, he calls us to make disciples. Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of age. At the end of the age. <clears throat> Preposterous claims, outrageous demands, is that what we've heard? Not when you stop to consider what Christ did for you and for me on the cross and giving his life. He gave his all so that you and I could have eternal life and, and forgiveness of sin and live an abundant life <coughs> here on earth in the present. All he really wants is your undivided loyalty. He wants your life. A kindergartner learned a poem that puts it like this. What can I give him as poor as I am? If I were a shepherd, I'd give him a lamb. If I were a wise man, I'd do my part. What can I give him? I'll give him my heart. In Luke 21, verses 1 through 4, we have the story of the widow's might. It says, And he looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts into the treasury. And he saw a poor widow putting in two small copper coins. And he said, Truly I say to you, this poor widow put in more than all the rest of them. For they all, out of their surplus, put into the offering. But she, out of her poverty, put in all that she had to live on. If all you've got are two pennies. Just two. Two copper coins. That's all you had. And you said, all right, Lord, here you go. Give that to Jesus right there. You've given more than anybody else if that's all you have. And the Bible teaches Jesus doesn't even ask us to give everything. You know, the Bible talks about the top, the 10%. In our giving, the issue isn't the amount but the cost. Whether you're giving money in an offering or whether you're giving yourself, like yesterday, a lot of folks give, gave all we had, you know, in terms of our service. I mean, I, I didn't vacuum every carpet in here. Thank, thank the Lord there were others who, who helped with the job, but I vacuumed a lot of carpets and my shoulder still feels it today. You know, for some folks to put $100 in the offering plate is simple. No big deal. For others to put even $1, you know, you have to wonder, well, will there be enough left to eat on this week? Uh, I'm reminded of a story that took place in the Old Testament in, in 2 Samuel chapter 24. After a, a plague had passed through Israel, uh, leaving an incredible death toll in its wake, David was instructed by the Lord to build an altar 
and sacrifice to him on this altar. And to do so, David sought to purchase a piece of property uh, from a man by the name of uh, Aron, uh, hearing the reason for his purchase, it was a threshing floor, and hearing the reason why the king wanted to buy his threshing floor, Aruna, offered to just donate it to, to the Lord. He could do that, you know, no big deal. He, was, he would be happy to do that. But David insisted in paying full price. He said, I will not sacrifice to the Lord of that which costs me nothing. There in 2 Samuel. A man after God's own heart, the Bible is called him. David reveals the Father's heart towards giving. God neither needs nor desires our tips. This woman back in Luke 21 just gave two mites, the Bible calls them, two little pennies. But that was all she had. We're all familiar with the story in John chapter 13, beginning in verse 1, where Jesus washes the disciples' feet. Let's, let's remind ourselves. Now before the feast of the Passover, Jesus, knowing that his hour had come, that he would depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During the supper, the devil, having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand, and that he had come forth from God and was going back to God, got up from supper, laid aside his garment, and taking a towel, he girded himself. Then he poured water into the basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. So here Jesus is sitting at dinner, suddenly aware that his disciples needed their feet washed. I don't know. Just look down, they had dirty feet. Nobody washed their feet. And in choosing to, to wash them, he interrupted his own meal, looks like. The truth is that if, if you're going to be someone who loves people, you can count on interruptions. Amen? <coughs> count on interruptions. And, and there you'll be with a bag of popcorn on your lap and the Chiefs on the TV, or maybe some of you are watching the Patriots. I'm not quite sure. Just say. <laughs> there they are, football on TV, and suddenly a knock on your door or a ring on your phone. And if you're going to be somebody who loves, it means that you're going to have to be willing to be interrupted. Notice not only interruptions, but also involvement. Jesus didn't stand up and say, smells funny in here, you know. I now want to tell you guys why you should wash your feet before you eat. Give them a, a lesson on cleanliness. You know, look at Peter. Peter, you big heel. Don't you see your, your foot's cruddy? Smells bad. James, your soul is dirty, you know. No, Jesus didn't give them a lecture about dirty feet. He just went down on his hands and knees and washed what needed washing. If, if you're not willing to wash feet, then, then keep your mouth closed when you see dirt. Amen? When I see dirt, I can either talk about the dirt, which is then called judging, according to the Bible, or I can involve myself in someone's life, tend to the situation on my knees in humility through intercession, through prayer. Jesus chose the latter. He didn't simply point out the dirt on the, on the feet of the disciples. He did something about it. Jesus' act was unannounced. He didn't stand up and say, Disciples, you will now see love in action. Watch me. Take notes. A few photos will be allowed. No, he just quietly got up, got down, filled the basin, took the towel. You know, had to take off his robe and put on the towel, and get down there and wash their feet. It wasn't something he announced. It wasn't something all of Jerusalem could see. He just quietly took care of what needed to be taken care of. Well, that would be easy, you say, if I had the opportunity to minister to guys like the disciples. Well, you need to think about those disciples a minute. Have you ever been around a political rabble-rouser? We've seen our, our season of politics here recently. 
political rabble rouser described Simon the Zealot, one of the disciples, or how about somebody so shy that not a single word of his is ever recorded in the Bible? That was James the Less. Or, or how about somebody who was skeptical of you? That was Nathaniel. Or, or one who would deny you, like Peter. Three times he denied you. Or how about somebody who would stab you in the back, like Judas? You know, by kissing you, greeting you with a kiss. Go from man to man to man in this group, and you'll see that they're people just like all the folks you live around. They're no different than we are. They're like people we see every single day. And yet Jesus, in a very beautiful, humble way, loved these guys who really weren't very lovable. And, and, and this gives me great hope because I'm not very lovable, lovable either sometimes. I have my good days and I have my bad days. You know? And, and it gives me great comfort to realize that the Lord loves me not because I'm lovable, because he, but because He is love. Jesus Himself is love. Jesus wants to wash Peter's feet, but what happens? Well, Peter protests, saying, you're not going to wash any part of me. And when Jesus corrects, them and he corrects him and explains to him, you know, what's going on, he said, well, wash, me, wash all of me, you know? Give me a bath. But that wasn't right either. You see, in addition to the pride of independence, there's a problem of over-dependence. Some people essentially say to, to us, if you don't help me every day in every way, you're just not a good Christian. Such people expect much from us and, and, and lay great demands upon us and seek to exploit and manipulate us to get more than what they need. Therefore, sometimes the loving thing to do is to say, I'm not the Lord in your life. You know, I can't be the solution to every single problem you have. I can help. I can wash your feet from time to time, but you don't need a bath. I'll just help you with the, with the, the issues that you need help with. What's the solution? Simply to say to people, I'll go with what I believe the Lord is showing me in my heart. I'll respond according to His leading, but not according to your demanding. The Bible tells us that the Lord's burden is easy. And his load is light in Matthew 11.30. Therefore, to any who would overload or overburden you, sometimes you just got to learn to say no. Amen? In our culture, not everyone wears sandals. Not everybody goes bare, barefoot. It seems like there's more people these days that do that, but not everybody. And, and even if they did, the roads aren't all that dusty or muddy. So this passage may not mean washing feet to us today. You know, you're... You're washing your car, let's say, in the front yard, and, and maybe it's old and cruddy and doesn't really run very well, but instead of complaining about your problems, why not extend the hose a little bit and go over and wash your neighbor's car, who might have a better car anyways, and look better if it was pretty and clean. Or maybe it means washing your neighbor's windows while he's on vacation, or, or it might mean changing diapers in the nursery here at church, or, or for a neighbor who's sick. Uh, and, and needing help taking care of the child, or, or washing dishes without being asked, or, you know, and you know that sounds good, you might say, but but I'm going through such a hard time right now that I'm I'm not in a position to wash anything, to help anybody. Really? Well, at any given point, at every single point in our lives, we live by Basin theology, what's been called Basin theology. In other words. We either call for the basin like Pontius Pilate did in Matthew 27 and wash our hands of everything we know to be true of ministry and service or we take up the basin like Jesus did and wash someone's feet in humility and love. You're either doing one or the other. At the, at the very time Jesus was going through a time of intensity, you know, he's, he knows he's heading for the cross. Uh, We'll never understand this side of heaven, you know, uh, why he did this. He didn't wash his, his hands like Pontius Pilate of those who would deny and those who would betray him. He washed their feet. That's, a, that's an amazing thing. That's an amazing thing. Positionally, we're the very righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So says 
2 Corinthians 5.21. But as we walk through the world, there's a need for cleansing of fellowship that takes place in the confession of our sins. We're born again, we're believers, we're going to heaven, but we still have feelings, we still have shortcomings, and we need to be washed continually. How? Well, 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We need to live in that place of continual confession in order to appropriate that finished work of Calvary and to eliminate Satan's toehold in our lives. One question from the lips of Jesus rings out loud and clear this season, this Christmas season. Recorded in Luke 6, 46, Jesus says, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? To be a Christian requires more than just talking the talk. On one occasion, the famous pianist Van Cliburn was asked how much time he spent practicing. Without hesitation, Van Cliburn said, I practice eight to nine hours a day. He noted that two of those hours, he would invest in nothing more than scales and fingering exercises. The basics, in other words. The price tag of excellence is high. How much does Christmas cost? Hold your life up to the claims of Christ and examine your relationship with Him this year and, and then answer how much Christmas will cost you this year. How much will it cost you to truly be able to be called a Christian, a follower of Jesus Christ? His child. His minister, sir. We're going to sing a song, I Surrender All. My question to you this morning is, do you? Have you surrendered all your life to Him? If you haven't, you may need to come and pray here at the altar while we're singing. If you need to give your life to Christ, I'll be here down front. You can come and say to me, I need to receive Jesus. I'll be happy to, to sit down with you on the front pew and lead you in a prayer to ask Jesus in your life. Maybe you just need to join the church here and be a part of this fellowship. However God leads you, you respond to him as we stand to sing. I surrender all. <laughs>